Welcome back again, everyone. I hope you enjoyed uh, your networking session. Uh, so you have probably all heard of Shama, the first 100% Moroccan humanoid robot. Joining us is the developer of this project, Professor Hajar Musanib, who is an associate professor and the founder of the Master Program in Data Science at Qadi Ayad University, Morocco. She holds a PhD degree in computer science, uh, an abbreviation degree in artificial intelligence, and an engineering degree in telecommunication. Her primary research interests include artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, IoT, human-computer interaction, and next-generation technologies. In addition to her academic experience, she chaired the program committee of many international conferences. She leads both the TINEMO and the NVIDIA AI Moroccan chapters. Hajar Musanif holds two patents on her work on artificial intelligence and was selected among five best female researchers in North Africa. She received many international awards, such as the L'Oréal UNESCO Award and the Emerald Literal Prize for Excellence. In December 2020, she was selected as the gold winner of the prestigious international pr prize, Women Tech Global AI Inclusion Award. So please enjoy her talk. Hello, it's my great honor and pleasure to be with you today in this first edition of Morocco AI Annual Conference. And I'm very happy to take part in this wonderful initiative to advance the state of R&D in the field of AI in Morocco and contribute to building a dynamic Moroccan AI uh, community. Uh, with the significant advances in information and communication technology over the last half century, Artificial intelligence, cloud computing, big data, Internet of Things, blockchain, and VR are rapidly emerging as the new pillars of the next generation of IT. With the cloud, we have infinite power of computation right in our pockets. Big data and AI take advantage of the technically unlimited storage and computing capabilities of the cloud to make predictive and prescriptive analytics and extract insight about every aspect of our lives. While Internet of Things connects everything that can be connected, and they also generate huge amounts of data waiting to be processed and analyzed. As you see here, all these technologies have something in common. They all deal in one way or the other with data. The IoT generates data in terms of sensing and collecting. The cloud stores and processes data. Big data derives data by combining large data sets. And AI learns from data, including big data. And of course, blockchain is a mechanism to reliably capture data, data transaction history in a distributed manner. So AI, cloud, big data, and Internet of Things blur the traditional boundaries and profoundly revolutionize the value chain of many vital sectors, including healthcare, transportation, education, and industry. And artificial intelligence in particular is reshaping the way human thinks and think and live. Uh, I mean, from virtual assistants uh, communicating with humans and offering relevant responses to their queries in real time to data analytics tools amassing torrents of data and using deep learning to sift through them, uh, the artificial intelligence field is really growing at an unprecedented uh, pace. But before diving into uh, this, let me first introduce well, my name is Hajar Musanif. I'm a professor of computer science at Qadayad University in Morocco. I'm very active in the artificial intelligence field, and I have been passionately promoting this technology as an enabler for a new economic development model. In my work, I do both teaching and uh, research. I'm a coordinator and founder of a, both a master and bachelor program in data science and artificial intelligence, in which I teach machine learning, deep learning, and big data analytics. On the research side, I'm uh, leading a couple of funded research projects covering different application areas, ranging from road safety to uh, agriculture. My community is made up of students, professors, AI enthusiasts, and data scientists. Um, also leading the Moroccan Tiny ML and NVIDIA chapters as well here in Morocco. So part of my community is also from embedded systems background. I'm followed by around oh, by more than 20,000 people on LinkedIn who are actively supporting my work. So you are really welcome to join my network. I have two patents in AI. 
Um, this is my first patent. It's around, it's around a um, process that allows a smartphone to recognize emotional states and react to them to support humans emotionally whenever and wherever they need it. The AI analyzes our smiles, our frowns and grimaces. It analyzes our voice as well as the text we, types, uh, we type. And once the emotional state is predicted, the idea is to push personalized content to the user to support him or her emotionally. So this content could be as simple as showing us through a video how to perform uh, abdominal breathing or maybe um, suggesting nice weekend vacations at affordable prices or maybe just sending us a funny content or a joke from time to time to help us like work in a better mood. Um, this is my second patent. So as a professor, I give a lecture in front of 500 students in an amphitheater and I don't understand if they have comprehended what I've been talking about. So my second patent is a, a smart chair with, with like sensors in it, which can figure out whether a student has understood or not just by analyzing the facial expressions, the posture, the way the students react to me. And the smart chair is, is equipped with vision, sensing and communication capabilities. And it's trained to like to detect at a much higher frequency than an ordinary human judge each student's reactions, making sense of them, and then reporting them to the teacher in real time. So then I got like a program on my smartwatch, which told me how many students understood what I had said in a classroom. So I could adapt my pedagogy in real time approach um, with respect to whatever the AI uh, told me. And um, this is one of my recently funded projects. It's an AI that estimates the risk of road crashes occurrence in real time based on the driver behavior, the vehicle telemetry, the weather, and the driver's um, physiological signals. So the project is about improving road safety with artificial intelligence. It was carried out using a fixed-based driving simulator located at Qada'iyad University, Narrakesh. And of course, we had like a full empirical control over the driving conditions, including all types of weather, ground and traffic. And you can find more details about this project, including our publications. We have really nice publications here in this uh, website, wisedrive.co. Um, as you know, every major company, everyone is talking about AI, whether it's pharma, cybersecurity, tech companies, um, possibilities are really immense. But just talking about AI doesn't mean you have like an efficient implementation strategy in place. Um, but before talking about the strategy itself, let me first talk about design uh, themes. So you have like um, two competing design themes in terms of how you incorporate technology into the world. You have first principles thinking, which, which says, well, we've had a major leap in technology. It changes everything. You should start from scratch. Or we have iterative thinking, where you gradually iterate on the existing model by incorporating technology and improve on it. So historically speaking, the biggest leaps uh, and the world's biggest changes have occurred through first principles thinking. And that's what's, what's hap what happens in the world uh, today. One concrete example of first principles thinking versus iter iterative thinking is that of the integration of Amazon Alexa by Capital One. So Capital One took the credit card and said, how do we how do we put this on the voice channel and let's see the result okay what's my account balance the current balance on your venture card ending in 4147 is $3,319.06 can i make a payment which card would you like to pay toward Venture card ending in 4147. Correct. You see here what they tried to like add voice into this credit card while first principles designers would say you don't need plastic to make a payment. You've got your voice or maybe your face. That's your unique identifier. And you can ask and 
this is uh, this is the difference between iterative thinking and first principles design so uh, let's uh, see how uh, ant financials smile to pay reasoned in terms of uh, first principles design so this is the, the smart to pay uh, smile to pay really interesting are you you've, you've certainly noticed the same thing I mean this uh, principles design thinking with what's happening with the metaverse so meta is also trying to completely reinvent the way people socialize learn collaborate and play so meta is reasoning in terms of first principles uh, thinking too imagine Put on your glasses or headset and you're instantly in your home space. It has parts of your physical home recreated virtually. It has things that are only possible virtually. And it has an incredibly inspiring view of whatever you find most beautiful. Hey, are you coming? Yeah, just gotta find something to wear. So completely reinventing the way people socialize and interact. And we're noticing this first principles design thinking with NFTs, the non-fungible uh, token uh, landscape. They're completely reinventing the way people buy, sell, and invest their money. They also make room for a lot of creativity, especially using AI, creation like of digital art, cartoons, avatars, and, and so on. So in summary, uh, there is three takeaways from this first part of my presentation. Fluency across multiple technologies is really critical and AI is only one brick. Organizational excellence in cloud and AI are key to access the full potential of other technologies. And it's not only about technology. We need to have like an effective mix of technology in residence and third party expertise. And in, term of, in terms of strategy, I think that AI first organizations have succeeded by organizing the effort like around um, four main elements. They prioritize the use cases with the biggest impact on customer experience and the most value for the company. They ensure that the data architecture, the data pipelines, um, the application programming interfaces, the APIs, and other essential components are available for building and deploying models at scale, like through standardized repeatable processes. And they, they establish like a semi-autonomous lab for um, experimentation and prototype development and set up like a factory for industrial scale production of the solution. And at the end, they assemble the right mix of talent for agile cross-functional teams and empower them to like maximize uh, value in close alignment, of course, with the enterprise strategy. So um, in the second part of my presentation, I want to discuss some flourishing areas in AI that will shape, I think they will shape its uh, future. Well, the first area is uh, transformers. And here we have really entered the golden era of natural language processing and not only natural language processing, computer vision as well. OpenAI's release of GPT-3 and China's the Wudawu 2.0 model 
um, captivated the technology world. They can write impressive poetry, they can generate functioning code, they can compose thoughtful memos, they can write articles about themselves, and so much more. So GPT-3 was trained on roughly 500 billion words and consists of 175 billion parameters. The Wudawo 2.0 model was trained using 1.75 trillion parameters. So Transformers' great innovation is to make language processing parallelized, so all token, tokens in a given body of text are analyzed at the same time rather than in a sequence. And in order, of course, to support this parallelization, Transformers rely heavily on an AI um, mechanism known as attention. So attention enables a model to consider the relationship between the words, regardless of how far they are uh, how far apart they are, and to determine which words and phrases in like a passage are most important to pay attention to. That's why I mentioned here, attention is all you need. This is the paper, by the way. Uh, of course, there are many, um, many website and many apps you can you can play with like if you you want to write with transformer or even generate code and we have the github autopilot which which is which is um uh, really cool and this is a demo of the open ai gpt3 generates the code. So you'll see this is really, really cool. And transformers can also do image captioning. I mean, you simply provide the image and the AI would provi provide the caption for that image. And you can really see how accurate is that is that is for example here you have like a cat sitting on a suitcase on the floor so it detected the cat it detected the suitcase and it shows even the action in that image and this is really uh interesting so the second area uh, of ai which i really find fascinating is federated learning so as you may know the standard approach to building ai models today is to like gather the data the training data in one place, uh, often in the cloud, and then to train model on that data. So rather than requiring one unified and big data set to train a model, federated learning simply leaves the data where it is, which means distribu distributed across numerous devices and servers on the edge. And uh, the, the, um, there will be there there will be an aggregator that would simply take the weights of each of the many models and aggregated aggregated to and then distribute those weights to those um, to those edge uh, devices. So potential applications of federated learning, of course, include almost all AI applications that involve sensitive data. I mean, from healthcare applications to uh, financial services to uh, autonomous vehicles, I mean, from government use cases to consumer products of really, of really uh, all kinds. And um, one, the cell phone maybe is the use case that normally come first to mind when speaking of federated learning. And a world application in this area is Google Next Word prediction, being Gmail or, or others. So naturally, the data you type in your emails is very sensitive, but by processing on the phone and only sending an encrypted partial train in derivatives, you may still learn among devices while preserving privacy. So the idea is uh, to not only enhance edge devices with the locally executed machine learning algorithms, but also to enable those devices to learn from each other through uh, federated learning. And of course, the applications of federated learning are, are, are really 
interest in, like voice recognition on mobile phones, or when we say, for example, hey Google or Alexa, uh, adapting to pedestrian behavior on autonomous vehicle. We can also imagine applications for personalized healthcare on wearable devices without having to send data to the cloud and um, predictive maintenance for uh, industrial um, applications. So of course, we have noticed that AI is kind of moving to the edge. So, and of course, as I mentioned, there are tremendous advantages of being able to run AI algorithms directly on devices at the edge. Like when I say edge, I, it could be smartphones, it could be smart speakers, cameras, vehicles, without sending uh, data back and forth from the cloud. And edge AI, as, I, as I've already mentioned, it enhances data privacy because data need not to be moved from its source to like remote server. And edge AI is also lower latency since all processing happens locally. And this makes a critical difference for time sensitive applications like, for example, autonomous vehicles or like voice assistants. And of course, it enables AI algorithms to run autonomously without the need for an internet connection, which is really good. And of course, this is the case also for TinyML, Tiny Machine Learning. This is a rapidly growing area of machine learning that targets artificial intelligence implementations for use on low power devices with really scarce, scarce, scarce computer and memory resources, like the millions of sensors deployed in the internet of things. And this is achieved at an exceptionally low power, I mean the milliwatt range and below, using like small, essentially self-contained um, neural networks and uh, upgrading, imagine upgrading uh, the potentially billions of existing microcontrollers or MCUs today with tiny EMOS capabilities that would definitely allow to bring machine intelligence right next to the physical world and unlock amazing applications by leveraging the huge amounts of data generated from those on-device sensors such as audio, um, vision, uh, IMU, instrument measurement unit, biomedical and, and, and the like. But of course, in order to move AI to the edge, AI models need to get smaller and developing techniques to shrink neural networks without compromising their uh, performance has become one of the most important research directions in the field of AI today. And the typical deep learning model today um, you have noticed is really massive. I mean, requiring like significant computational and storage resources in order to run. Like if I take the example of OpenAI's um, GPT-3, this requires more than 350 gigabytes just to store the model. And even models that don't approach GPT-3 in size, uh, like the ResNet-50, uh, which is commonly used in computer vision, uses 3.8 billion uh, floating point operations per second to process an image. So of course, these models cannot run at the edge. The hardware processors in the edge are simply not powerful enough to support them. And developing models or methods, sorry, to make deep learning models more lightweight represents really critical unlock and uh, I'll, I'll, it, it leads to a lot of, of, of opportunities for those, for those devices. So um, there are many uh, techniques like to shrink or, or reduce the size of um, the neural uh, network. Um, some of them include like um, pruning, quantization, uh, low rank factorization, uh, com compact convolutional filters and knowledge uh, distillations. Pruning entails um, identifying and eliminating like the redundant and, and important connections in a neural network in order to like slim it down. And quantization compresses the model by using like fewer bits to uh, represent values. In um, low rank factorization, a model tensors are decomposed in order to construct sparser versions that approximate the original tensors. And compact convolutional fil filters are um, specially designed um, uh, to, like, to, to, uh, uh, to 
to reduce the number of parameters required to carry out convolution. And uh, knowledge distillation involves like using a full-sized version of a model to teach like a smaller uh, model to mimic its outputs. The, the other interesting area of AI, which I love a lot, is generative AI. So generative AI is a fast growing new field that focuses on um, building AI that can generate its own novel content. And to put it simply, generative AI takes artificial intelligence beyond perceiving to um, creating. Generative AI is a fast growing new field that focuses on um, building AI that can generate its own novel content. Uh, generative AI uh, may, may, uh, may um, use text, audio files, images to create new uh, plausible uh, content and they enable computers to learn the underlying um, patterns related to the input and then use that like to generate similar content. And one of the most exciting areas uh, uh, of this generative AI is GANs, so generative adversarial networks. So those are models that like use two, um, two neural networks like put against each other. Uh, we have like a generator and a discriminator. The generator is a neural network that is responsible for generating the new data or content that resembles the source data. And the discriminator is a neural network that is responsible for differentiating between the source data and the generated data. So both of those um, neural networks are trained like in alternating cycles where the generator constantly learns to produce more realistic data um, while the discriminator gets better and better at differentiating fake data from the real data. And of course, eventually, the discriminator's success rate will fall to 50%, so no better than random guessing, meaning that the synthetically generated content have become indistingu indistinguishable from the originals. And there are many applications of GANs. They like can they can transform photo editing and make it easier to add subtract elements such as backgrounds, etc. They can generate special effects. We see a lot of it in TikTok uh, these days. And they can also um, contribute to creative products. I mean, from industrial design to fine art. And they can generate like here fake faces and faces that don't even exist and they also generate deep fakes for example here i took a photo of me i simply uploaded a photo of me and a video of obama and it generated me speaking like obama so a lot of deep fakes is there um one of the most promising use cases for generative ai is synthetic data synthetic data is a potentially game-changing technology that enables practitioners to digitally fabricate the exact data sets that they need to train AI models. So getting access, of course, to the right data is both the most important and the most challenging part of AI today. So um, it, generally, in order to train a deep uh, learning model, we must collect thousands of or maybe millions of data points from the real world and then label have the label labels attached to this data to each of course each data point before the model can learn from the data and of course this is at best an expensive and time consuming process at worst the data one needs is simply impossible to get one's hands on so synthetic data enables practitioners to artificially create high fidelity data sets on demand tailored to their precise needs uh, using synthetic data methods. Um, I can think of an example of autonomous vehicles, autonomous vehicle companies that can like generate billions of different driving scenes for their vehicles to learn from without needing to actually um, encounter each of these scenes on the real world. Um, synthetic scans for medical AI can also be generated to improve like um, 
convolutional neural network accuracy at recognizing disease symptoms and medical scans of patients, for instance. So you can see here that the technology or the core technologies um, underlying synthetic data and deepfakes are the same, yet the use cases and potential real-world impacts have nothing to do with, um, with each other. But of course, this is true for all uh, innovations and artificial intelligence or generative AI is not an exception. This is something I love. This is machine hallucination and generative art. really interesting in terms of what AI and what generative AI can do. I, I thought of another use case of generative AI or uh, the use of GANs. Actually, I was honored to be a reviewer of a PhD thesis of a very special person who defined her PhD two years ago, despite her handicap. So let me introduce Latifa and you'll get a better idea of what I'm talking about. So Latifa suffers from a cerebral, cerebral palsy and has disfluences in her speech. <laughs> So, in this project, we provide no medical nor psychological study about the source of the problem, but what we try to do is build a deep learning framework capable of correcting disfluences in speech and generating a new version of the speech, which is fluent and easy to understand. So the framework uses like generative adversarial networks, or we first focused on stuttering, which is a speed disorder causing like a discontinuity in the flow of sound. And the idea of the project is like to convert stuttered speech to fluent version of speech so that Latifa can only speak through some um, device and the device would output a corrected version of her speech. And to attain the mapping that can transform stuttered speech to a fluent version, we have recorded and collected speech data of stuttered speech and their corresponding fluent speech. And the speech in our data sets, of course, included um, many speakers with different languages, including English, French, and Moroccan dialects. And those speech samples were later pre-processed examples and converted to spectrographs to extract features that contain intensity information of time varying spectra. Um, in this project, we used um, a, a modified version of GAN called Conditional Generative Adversarial Network. And uh, it's the same idea. We have like two uh, types of network architectures. We have the two, two models that stand together like in an adversarial way. The generator tries to generate samples that look like real world data. And disc the discriminator tries to distinguish between the real data and the data generated by the generator. And here's the demo of our, of, of our project. This is the stuttered version. This is the target, what we want to achieve. And this is the, the version generated by AI. Where the, the filter band is, is based on the, the behavior of the, the, the basilar membrane. This is the where the filter bank is based on the behavior of the basilar membrane. This is the target. Where the filter bank is based on the behavior of the basilar membrane. Well, of course there are uh, sorry. Of course there are many rooms for improvement for this project. We need more volunteers and more stuttered speech data so we can improve our model and uh, do more for the people suffering from speech disorders. So to wrap up this talk, I think that AI is a wonderful revolution and it's already altering the way we perceive the world around us and raising important questions for society, the economy, and humanity as a whole. However, we need to understand what is we want from AI 
identify the right problems to solve with AI and to tailor our methodology to those needs. We should also continue protecting human oversight and control, guarding against AI biases and uh, penalizing malicious AI behavior. And if there is one takeaway from this uh, presentation, I think that we can no more do things the traditional way when the whole world is um, moving. And thank you very much for your attention. So many, many thanks uh, to Professor Hajar Musannif, who is with us today and who accepted our invitation. Uh, we hope you enjoyed her talk and we hope uh, you enjoyed the discussion as well. Uh, so uh, I'm going to conclude here. See you this afternoon.